Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Know How is brought to you by Lynda.com. Learn what you want when you want with access to over 2,400 high quality online courses, all for one low monthly price. To try it free for seven days, visit lynda.com slash knowhow. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash knowhow. And by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. For a free two-week trial and 10% off, go to squarespace.com and use the offer code knowhow. On this episode of Know How, making rocket fuel out of sunlight, we answer your questions about building a computer, gyro-stabilized platforms, and stream your steam. Welcome to Know How. It's the Twitch show where we build, bend, break, and upgrade. I'm Father Robert Fallows here. And I'm Brian Burnett. And for the next, actually, I can keep saying 30 minutes. That's never 30 minutes. For the next no. hour, we're going to take you through some of the projects that we've been working on so that you, maybe you can geek out in your real life. Don't worry about the time. Just sit back, relax, and learn. And learn. We're, open up your learn holes. <laughs> we're going to be dumping a lot of stuff in there. Now, uh, Brian, hmm. you know how, you know, like, we need sunlight? Yeah, sunlight's good, nice. right? Uh, that's how I got this sweet tan that yeah, I have. Yeah, that's how I got this mm -hmm, sweet sun, mm -hmm. sunburn. <laughs> well, it's, you know, sunlight's not just for tanning. It's not just for sunburning. Did, did you know that you can actually make fuel out of sun? Well, I've, I mean, I understand the concept of solar power. Yeah, I mean, but photosynthesis. But, yeah, you know, when we think of solar power, we normally think of like plants turning a light energy into, you know, through photosynthesis yeah. into into energy they can consume. Or we think of stuff like this, right? Solar. Yeah, power. that's yeah, that's the first thing I think. Right, of. direct conversion of sunlight into electricity. Right, it's useful and uh, it's kind of cool but yeah. there's actually a new effort to turn sunlight directly into a different type of fuel specifically mm. into hydrogen now check this out the eu has funded a project that is attempting to use concentrated sunlight and turn water and carbon dioxide into jet fuel <laughs> that's kind of the dream right yeah to right? be able to turn water into just fuel just water fuel. I mean, and, and you know all the ingredients are there we right. know that hydrogen hydrogen is is energy packed if we, there was a way to, to get pure hydrogen out of the molecules that it's attached to the like, separating part is separating power difficult. is pain in yeah. the butt. No. <laughs> Typically, when we want to get hydrogen out of water, we would electrolyze it. You, you'd run a positive and a negative electrode into water. You get hydrogen bubbling off of one side. You get oxygen bubbling off hmm. the other side. Okay. And you have to collect it. It's very energy intensive. It's kind of a pain in the butt. It's not all that efficient. The EU has figured a way around it with a project they're calling Solar Jet. <laughs> That's uh, pretty clever. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> now, the question is, how does it work, right? Right. Okay. Right. So imagine this. You have a pressure vessel, mm -hmm. and in that pressure vessel, you've got all this light that's been collected with solar collectors, which is a fancy way of saying mirrors. Okay. So they're all focusing light into this pressure vessel, which has a way of getting the light into the pressure vessel. Okay. Well, physics 101, whenever you, in, whenever you focus a lot of radiative energy, light energy, into an enclosed space, you're going to raise the temperature. When you raise the temperature, you're also going to raise the pressure. So now you've got a vessel that's incredibly hot, and incredibly dense, very pressurized, right. right? Okay, yeah, there's a lot of forces at work there. A lot of forces at work, and physics as we know it doesn't work quite uh, the same. So what they do is they take advantage of that to pump carbon dioxide, so that's CO2, right. and water vapor, which is H2O, mm -hmm. into the pressure vessel. At those temperatures, at that pressure, it actually cracks the molecules. And what ends up happening is you break the O2 away from carbon dioxide, you break the H2 away from H2O, and instead you now get uh, carbon monoxide, you get a molecule of O2, mm -hmm. and you get a molecule of H2. So for every molecule of H2O and CO2, uh -huh. you get one molecule of pure hydrogen, 
one molecule of pure oxygen and one molecule of carbon monoxide. Very cool. Yeah. Okay. So it acts, it's just it's splitting them into little just, individual yeah, it, it parts. It splits them up and then they, they naturally form back into those molecules. The cool thing so is you cool. can pump away the hydrogen and now you have pure hydrogen that you could turn into methanol. You could turn it into basically anything. In fact, this right here, this is a device that I, I uh, got at CES last year. Mm -hmm. The whole idea is it uses a sodium silicate cartridge to contain ox uh, hydrogen. It's, it's actually, it's very dense with hydrogen. Okay. When you add water to the sodium silicate, you get heat and hydrogen. Hydrogen just bubbles out. Okay. And then it goes into this. This is a magical, magical device. What is this? That's actually a fuel cell. That's a oh. hydrogen fuel cell. And the only byproduct is water. Water, but, right. Yeah. Water and, and heat. So the way it works is if you pump hydrogen into that little inlet there, you're going to run it through what's called a PEM, oh, which yeah. is a proton exchange, me exchange membrane, and you get water, and a small electrical charge. Well, you have a lot of those membranes, and this will actually charge an internal battery, which in turn can charge a five volt device. Yeah, I see that there's a little uh, a little USB thing there. Wow. Right. Okay. Right. So that's so, super cool. Exactly. So if we have a process that can turn light, uh, take light and turn carbon dioxide and and H2O into a hydrogen fuel source, right. we can now run it through a hydrogen fuel cell. Right. I mean, I remember a few years ago, Honda made a hydrogen fuel cell powered car mm -hmm. and the only byproduct was water, but the hard part was getting, getting the hydrogen, hydrogen for the cell, the fuel cells. Right. Because piping hydrogen around the world is, it's dangerous. It's, yeah. yeah. I remember that they used to put it in blimps, uh, if I recall correctly. Yeah. I can't remember. No, no, not striking any. <laughs> no, they didn't uh, call them solar blimps though, no, did they? they totally no, didn't. No, they didn't. Okay. No. But, but the other use of this is you can actually take that H2 and you can make hydro, uh, uh, oxygen tetrahyzine, tetra rocket fuel. Rocket fuel. You can make oh, okay. rocket fuel, which is it's, it's like four, four hydrogens on top of a, a carbon atom. I can't oh, okay. remember the formula. But that's powerful stuff. But it's powerful stuff. Yeah. But you cool, could cool, take cool. this process and you could directly use it to create rocket fuel. fuel. Wow. And that, that's pretty cool. That's Using the sun cool. and basic water to make fuel. Fuel. Making like fuel. It out of nothing at all. <laughs> That's much more cool. efficient than solar cells and uh, much more flexible too. Well, and then there's also the the NIF or whatever, the uh, the lab where they use the lasers. Yeah, the, the They the focus ignition, the lasers the to make yeah. fusion. Well, that's, so is, that's, that's different. That's so that's, else, yeah, yeah, what they're doing is they're fusing uh, atoms together. So uh, versus yeah. nuclear power as we know it today is all about fission. It's taking a, typically an a, a, a atom of uranium-235 mm -hmm. and uh, uh, putting it in close proximity to another one shooting a neutron at it, splitting it apart, creating two more neutrons, which can then hit other uranium-235 atoms and creating a chain reaction that creates heat. Right. Fusion, you're actually taking elements and you're slamming them together, making yeah. heavier elements. And that, that's, they, they have, I don't I think they've had a few successful tests, but this is, this is cool, like using yeah. this, the sun to do yeah. this. Okay. Yeah, cool. It's all about energy. It's all about energy. We love energy. Uh, anything to reduce our carbon footprint and yep. hopefully reduce, reverse global warming, but that's probably not really gonna happen. I just want anyway. rocket fuel. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, if we can make the, enough rocket fuel, we can. I don't get know off what you're planet. talking about, yeah. but I just want. I want to go. <laughs> now, folks, uh, we're here on Know How because we know that you like to learn. We know that you are the, the smart folks that like to get online and find out things that you haven't known about before. And thankfully, one of the sponsors of Know How is Linda. Now, Linda.com is the source for online knowledge. It's what we use here at Twit whenever we need to brush up on a subject. Now, I did say brush up. Because Linda is not just about learning new things. Linda is a great resource for if you need to relearn something that you have forgotten. Now, Linda.com is known as the leader in online education because, well, that's what they do. That's what they've dedicated themselves to do. Linda.com helps you keep up to date with software, learn brand new skills, and explore new hobbies with easy to follow video tutorials. Whether you want to make the most out of your camera gear, learn the latest version of Photoshop, or edit your own video footage using Final Cut Pro, Lynda.com offers thousands of topics in a variety of courses. At Lynda.com, watch and learn how to attach a GoPro to a quadcopter, something I think you'd be interested oh, in, yeah. Yeah, in their weekly series called DSLR Video Tips. You can turn your laptop into a live performance instrument and learn to play backing tracks, process vocals, and loop sounds with Mainstage. Their new releases include 3D printing with Photoshop, where you can learn how to prepare and print your 3D models with Photoshop, and up and running with Square Register where you can learn how to start taking payments anywhere with the Square Register service. The payment processing solution that's perfect 
for small businesses. Now, personally, I've been into Final Cut Pro. It's, it's sort of been my thing recently. I know a lot of you have had to learn Premiere. It's, it's the, that's the editor I've been using. So I figured it's only fair that I start taking a look at Final Cut. I, you I, like to suffer. I like to suffer. Well, no, I played <laughs> with it a while back. It, it's yeah. a good nonlinear editor. Mm -hmm. It's just, it wasn't my, my thing. Cup of tea. But not that's the beauty of, of Linda. You can learn new things or see yep. if you like them or not. Exactly. And, and the nice thing about Linda is that it allowed me to skip back and forth. You know, it's not one of these things where, okay, here's a video, watch the video. Mm -hmm. There's chapters. There's transcripts. They tell you exactly where you can find things. So, for example, if I'm trying to learn Final Cut Pro and I'm thinking, well, I know how I do this in Adobe Premiere. I know how I do color correction. Where do I do color correction in Final Cut Pro? I don't have to scan through everything to find, like, look at the screen. Is he doing color correction? Is he? Right. No. I'll, instead, I just go to the transcript. I say, locate color correction. And, and it will skip tell me. To the, maybe it's even in the middle of the video and it, you can skip yeah. straight. And, and actually, there's even a chapter about color correction. This is what Linda's all about. This is what they're good at giving you the knowledge you need when you need it. Now, Linda offers courses for all experience levels, beginner, intermediate, and advanced, and their instructors are accomplished professionals at the top of their fields, passionate about the teaching. Linda.com works with software companies to provide you updated training the same day new versions hit the market, so you always have the very latest skills. With over 2,400 courses and more added each week, Linda.com courses are produced at the highest quality, not like the homemade videos on YouTube, which we love, Sometimes you want good audio, sometimes you want good lighting, sometimes you want good camera work. It just takes all those elements out of the equation when you're trying to learn something new. Sometimes you just want to be able to find part two. Exactly. <laughs> sometimes you just want to be able to skip ahead. That's what lynda.com lets you do. Whether you have 15 minutes or 15 hours, each course is structured so that you can learn from start to finish. Lynda.com also offers certificates of completion when you finish a course, which means you can publish your LinkedIn profile with these certificates, hmm. which is great if you're a professional in that field. So here's what we want you to do. We want you to try Lynda. Learn something new with Lynda.com. It's only $25 a month for access to the entire Lynda.com course library, or for $37.50 a month, you can subscribe to the premium plan, which includes exercise files that let you follow along with the instructor's projects using the exact same assets. And you can try lynda.com right now with a free seven-day trial. Visit lynda.com slash know-how to access the entire library. That's over 2,400 courses, free for seven days. It's all at lynda.com slash know-how. And we thank Linda for their support of know-how. Speaking of streaming things to multiple devices, what if I told you there's a way to do it with your gaming PC? Impossible. <laughs> On a Mac? If you, could you stream Impossible. stuff to your Mac? No, you, uh... no. <laughs> Speaking of witchcraft now. You're such a doubter. I know. No, no, this, okay. this is something that has been going on for a while, right? Yes. We, we, remember there was a service not too long ago that, that offered this idea of it would... On live. On live, yeah. right, where, where you didn't need a high-spec computer because mm -hmm. essentially all your computer was doing was receiving a streaming video right. and all the processing was done at a server far, far away. It was a pipe dream. It was a pipe dream. It Ultimately, did. it folded. It yeah. died. Yeah, there was a lot of latency issues. There were a lot of performance issues. But are you telling me that uh, maybe we're ready for another go? We're getting closer. Yes, it's still in beta, but there's something called Steam Streaming that came out hmm. fairly recently. And what this allows you to do is use your, your powerful gaming PC that you might have in the home and send it to a different device. So for example, I was playing my PC games on my MacBook Air, which unfortunately, you know, some of the games you can't play on Macs, uh, but I was playing Titanfall. It doesn't even have to be a Steam game. It can be any game that you have in your Steam library on your list. So it's pretty simple, uh, and I made a video to show you how to do it. Well, how about this, Brian? Why don't you go ahead and blow my mind? So the first step to start streaming using Steam is to have it installed on your gaming PC, which is the host, and then have it also installed on your client, and which in my case is my MacBook Air. In the Steam Preferences, under Account, you'll see a box where it says Beta Participation. Click the Change button, and you'll be prompted to be able to change from uh, not using the beta to Steam Beta Update. Once you check that and update Steam, you should see a new tab saying In-Home Streaming. Click that, and if you are on the same network as your host machine, it should pop up right away, and this is named 
gamers because Padre did that. And that's our gaming PC. So now we're connected, and if you look at my games list, it's not just the games that are installed on my Mac, but also the games that are installed on the gaming PC. So unfortunately, Goat Simulator is not a Mac game, but since I'm streaming from the gaming PC, I'll be able to play on my MacBook Air. So I hit the stream button, and you can see it loads up just like it would if I was playing it on my PC. And down in the bottom left-hand corner, you can see the resolution it's set at, which I have it set to automatic, uh, and I let Steam decide, so it's 1280 by 720, and I'm getting a solid 60 frames per second. This is over the Twit's guest Wi-Fi also. I don't have it hardwired, which would be the optimum way to do this. But you can see the game runs perfectly smooth, and there's no noticeable input lag from the controls. Now, that was a single-player game, but what if I tried playing a multiplayer game? I'd like to point out that I am doing this over Wi-Fi, so it's not optimal. But now that Game of Thrones is over, I was playing a game to get my fix called Chivalry, which is a first-person medieval war game, and there was some lag, but it was definitely playable. And when I tried playing a FPS at home, it worked fine. I think just because we have a lot of RF interference at Twit that uh, I was getting a little bit of lag. But here you can see the desktop of my PC and the screen on my MacBook Air, and it's mirrored perfectly, even though we're going from over Wi-Fi. So now you're streaming to the client device that you want, but what if you have a Mac and you want to use an Xbox controller to play in your living room? Fortunately, there's an option from Tataboogle to download Xbox 360 drivers that will allow you to use your Xbox controller that you use for your PC on your Mac. Navigate to the website, download the latest drivers, and once you install those and restart your Mac, you can go into System Preferences and there will be an Xbox controller configuration, which should already be mapped perfectly with the controller using the triggers, the buttons, and the joysticks. So now you can hook up your laptop to the big TV in your living room, use the Xbox controller to play it, you'll be utilizing your gaming PC in another room, and It'll look better on your TV than even the Xbox One. And if you're a glutton for pain, you can play Dark Souls 2 on a MacBook Air in your living room. So that's Steam streaming in a nutshell, and uh, back to the studio. Well, uh, that's actually, you know, that's really good performance. That's much better than I thought you'd be able to get. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, I mean, I'm using a MacBook Air that doesn't have crazy graphical specs, but it can play you know, uh, high de definition video. And so that's why I recommend you don't want to just try and find the most basic piece of hardware that you have in your right. house. But if you have something a little bit more modern or maybe an old net laptop that is playable with uh, HD video, you can use that, set it up in your living room, and then you can play games not on your central PC. That, that's actually how I see this. I don't see this as find the jankiest piece of garbage you've got lying around your den yeah. and turn it into a gaming machine. I'm seeing it as, well, I've got a nice, Ultrabook, which right. obviously I'm not going to be playing high frame rate gaming on, but if it's decent enough, if it's comfortable for me to use, I can make it a game machine leveraging the equipment I already have on my network. Exactly. Yeah, and it's that, just that like, it's so cool to be able to play on a Mac laptop games that <laughs> it's like, this game's never going to come out for Mac. Right but, right. but now I can. The only thing is, when I first heard about this project, I was hoping that I could make like a low powered Raspberry Pi for this project, um, but it doesn't work with ARM. Yeah. It's only x86 processors. That could change, though. I that mean, could change. That could change. They in the just future. have to recompile the code for ARM, which, again, it's going to take a while. And you know, honestly, I don't know how good of an experience you get off of a Raspberry Pi. I know a Raspberry Pi can can receive high definition video just fine. Yeah. But what has me worried is this: one of the issues about this sort of gaming has always been the lag. That's really what killed on live, right? Yes, because, because you're you're giving the input, yeah. it's going out, and then it's coming back. But I was playing on it. I was uh, sitting in my bedroom with my laptop, and I was playing Titanfall, and that's a fat first person shooter. And I wasn't getting any lag, input lag. It, I don't know. They've worked some steam magic. Right, right. It, well, actually, you know, that's one of the things where if, if you're on the home network, there should be very little latency. Right. I mean, you're, you're, you're living on, your, on the same wire as the other machine. It's not like you're going across the internet. 
One of the issues I would be worried about, though, is if you're using a wireless device, you'd have to make sure that your wireless network is set up properly. I know you didn't have any issues. No. But if you were in a really RF crowded area with a lot of inter interference, you could possibly run into those infuriating situations where you're doing some heavy FPS gaming and it lags for just a frame, but it's enough to get you killed. Right. And yeah, that's one of the last cons is that it's only on your home network. Uh, okay. So you can, I, I can't play games here at work from my PC at home, but... Although I'm sure that's going to be hacked because <laughs> you know, think about it. All you'd have to do is set up a VPN so that you're back into your home network. And then to the Steam system, it looks like you're in the network. I'm sure Padre could figure out a way to Actually, do that. Actually, that's not a bad know-how. We should... Okay, so huh? we're going to come back. We're going to huh? show you how to get remote gaming using a VPN back into your Steam network. Yeah, and someone in the chat room asks, like, well, did your MacBook Air get very hot? And it's like, yep. not at all. I did barely use yep. any battery life either because it was just it was just accepting the video. Yeah, it's not doing it. My PC yeah. in my room was just was doing all the work. And that's one of the cons though, is the PC that you're using for, to stream the games, you're not gonna be able to use it while you're doing it. Like, Which it's is basically funny. remote desktop, but for games. Yeah, yeah. It, see, with, with RDP though, with remote desktop, you can have multiple sessions and still use the desktop. Yeah. This is gonna lock out the desktop. You right. can't do anything while it's streaming. Yeah. Which, I, I could, See a bunch of reasons why they did that. And it's still in beta, so I did have a couple of crashes, and there was a couple times where I had to get up and walk into the room where my PC was and reboot it and start the game over and stuff. But for the majority, it was super smooth and it was cool. Yeah, super smooth and cool. Hey, speaking of super smooth and cool, you know what else is really super smooth and cool? And cool? Uh, a slick bit of software called Squarespace. Yeah, Squarespace. Now, if you haven't heard about Squarespace, you're a bad person and you should probably turn off the stream right now. feel bad. Yeah, no, I'm just kidding. We love you all and we want you to know about Squarespace. Squarespace is the space that you should go to if you're thinking about starting up a high quality blog or, or a website. You see, when you create a website today, there's there's a lot of places that offer things that are good. Uh, you got one site that has really good hosting. You have one site that has really good design. You have another site that takes care of the back end, like e-commerce. But trying to get one site that does everything, so you only get one bill, you only have to deal with one set of hassles, well, that's the specialty of Squarespace. Now, if you have ever use Squarespace, you know how good it is. It's a, it's a great way to get a blog or website up and running immediately without worrying about downtime, without worrying about a lot of little details you have to take care of. It's a great way to share a weekend project blog or provide the ability to jumpstart a side startup project with a professional, and I mean professional, looking site, and the ability to quickly and easily take orders and sell creations. Some of the reasons why you'll love Squarespace is that they're constantly improving their platform. They are not willing to sit back on their laurels. They're always giving you new features, new designs, and better support. Now, they're also really flexible. For DIYers, this is important because you don't want to be stuck in their templates, and they don't demand you stay in them. There are a set of tools to create your own website without code, from design tools like Layout Engine to the Logo Creator, a platform for customizing those sites, especially if you do know enough code to get under the hood. And uh, since the developer, developer platform is super robust, you'll always be able to expand as your skills grow. Squarespace also offers beautiful designs. They have 25 beautiful templates for you to start with, and they recently added a Logo Creator tool which is a basic tool for individuals and small businesses with limited resources to create a simple identity for themselves. Squarespace is also easy to use. It's easy to use, but if you want to want some help, Squarespace has live chat and email support 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Plus, there's a completely redesigned customer help site for easier access to self-help articles and video workshops. They also offer you e-commerce, like I said, which is great for, for nonprofits, for cash weddings, registries, and for school fund drives. And it's inexpensive. It starts at just $8 a month and includes a free domain name if you sign up for a year. One of the things I really enjoy about Squarespace is that they're mobile ready. They're not one of these sites that will look bad on a phone or a tablet because it's, it's been formatted for just a PC or a desktop. It will dynamically resize and reformat your content so it looks as good on a phone as it does on someone with a high-definition PC. Now, even their code is beautiful. And you, you may know that I'm also the host of Coding 101. Well, Squarespace looks just as good on the inside as it does on the outside. They take just as much pride in their back-end code as they do in those 25 beautiful designs up front. Now, again, hosting is included, so you won't have to worry about multiple bills from multiple companies. Squarespace is your one-stop shop. 
So here's what we want you to do. We want you to start your two-week free trial with no credit card required and start building your website today. When you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use the offer code KNOWHOW to get 10% off and to show your support for KnowHow. We thank Squarespace for their support of KnowHow. A better web awaits, and it starts with your new Squarespace website. You want to know what my favorite part is about my Squarespace site? What? <laughs> Checking how many people have subscribed. That's it. That's <laughs> like, cool, right? Looking at the numbers, it's like, like oh, you have oh, two yes. new subscribers. Oh, 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 oh. It's like, oh, I, I should probably feeling. keep updating it then. Yeah, well, I'm not, you know what the worst part about that is, though? What's that? Like saying, oh, you have 30 new subscribers and you haven't updated your site in like four months. <laughs> yeah, that's I, what that's, I was wondering. I mean, I'm nowhere near that number. <sighs> <sighs> Sorry about that, folks. But, that's my mm. bad. Okay, right. now, a while back, I decided I wanted to start up a, start up a project. We, mm. we were getting really into the Raspberry Pi, so I thought, hey, you know what Love I want to do? Pies. I want to make an auto-stabilizing platform. Sure, why not? That shouldn't be too difficult. Right, right. So it, all you need is you need some sort of solid, scape, s solid state gyro, something that tells you if you're tipping this way, that way, you know, two axes, right? Right, That's, right. that's really okay. all you need. So I got that. I got a shield that plugged into the Raspberry Pi. I, I got this case so I could build my project inside this case and then build a mount on it for the cameras. Very cool. I, I even got myself a, a, a display shield so that I could see the what was going on inside of, uh, let's go ahead and put this, inside of the Raspberry Pi as I was playing with it. Mm -hmm. Now, again, a very, very versatile computer. It just used the uh, GPIO in order to get that information in. Right. And then it drove a set of two two servos that as there was, uh, you know, as it tipped this way, the servo would push it back. Or right. as it tipped this way, the servo would push it back. And the idea was those servers would be installed right below the case, so the case would always be level no matter what I did with it. Right, so if it tipped a little bit, it would tell it adjust this much to right. get back to level, right? Right. Okay. Really simple, right? Sure. I almost burned down my house. <laughs> Probably not the first time that's happened, <laughs> yeah. but I'm curious to know how. Okay, so I, I think there was a voltage mismatch somewhere. I act and actually, I think my code was wrong because what it ended up doing when I tipped this way, it yeah. would tip it even more. <laughs> and I couldn't figure it out because the code looked right. And I was going over it going, what's this? So at some point, I flipped the, the servo. I'm like, maybe I just have this. And it did the same thing. So I'm like, I'm totally. That's weird. Yeah. That's weird. And, and yeah, it started a spell fire. OK. All right. <laughs> so I. Um, uh, do you do you I mean, typically I, have a fire extinguisher near you when you start projects? Because you might want to invest hall. in that. It was, yeah. it was down the hall. Oh, it was down the hall. <laughs> it was down the hall. Uh, yeah, that was not good. The worst part about it yeah. is the, the, uh, the so no. the I live at a school in San Francisco, and the fire department is two blocks down. And every time the school fire alarm comes over, they respond, it's $1,500. Oh, wow. I thought that you were going to say they had your name on no, file or no. something. Like, what so, do you do this time? So as the smoke is coming up, I'm like, I throw it out the window. And I'm like <gasps> waving. I'm like, don't go off. Don't go off. Don't go off. It didn't go off. But I, mean, I was thinking, I'm not going to pay $1,500. <laughs> uh, there goes your pork bun budget yeah, for the month. Exactly. And who would suffer? Me. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, so this didn't work. Uh, which is fine. Failure is always an option. Sometimes we just need to have it's, a fresh look. It's about the attempt. It's about the attempt. I like the idea, but the execution needed a little work. <laughs> execution sucked. Right. But uh, let me tell you, at NAB 2014, I saw a couple of attempts whose execution was awesome. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look. Every year, everyone who's even remotely connected to content production comes to one place. The mecca of all things video and audio, ladies and gentlemen, NAB 2014, Las Vegas. We're here at DJI, and I'm sitting next to Paul, who, uh, well, Paul, you're holding the Ronin. What is this? Yeah, this is our uh, all-new three-axis uh, camera stabilization system, and uh, it has these kind of modes, like uh, you have this smooth track mode where it's going to translate your movement, uh, your pan, you have your uh, pitch. Um, we also have, you know, we have, besides this uh, standard underslung uh, control mode, we have another mode where you can bring it down like this <clears throat> and then this will allow you to get closer to your body most times if you're under slung you're always shooting at your chest or, or, or stomach level you do this and then you suddenly are at eye level um, all of this is all automatically controlled through our uh, complex algorithms and 32-bit uh, processors um, this gimbal system uh, is made for the 
uh, is more consumer friendly, meaning you know price comes down. You have the ability to change what is it, the deadlock or the dead band, so you can either have the camera locked in on a particular object, no matter where you move it, or you could have it slowly follow it. So again, you get those buttery, buttery smooth pans. Yeah, that's true. Um, the dead band uh, can be adjusted uh, based off the app. It's all adjusted through the Bluetooth app, and then. Um, you can also control the speed at which you, your, your movement translates. We call that smooth track. Um, so as you pan, you'll see that it smoothly moves over instead of a sudden jerk, which will, tra which will translate to a very jerky video. We, uh, besides the app, we also have a uh, secondary operator remote control system. So if, say, you know, one person's holding this, uh, or if you attach this to a jib, uh, you have remote control capability of the system. All right, brass tacks. We know that the system is going to run for four hours on a charge. But, uh, and I know this is a prototype, so you can't tell me things like how much it weighs. Well, I know it supports, was it 15 or 16 pounds? 16 pounds. Okay. So 16 pounds of support. What's the price availability? Because I know there's a lot of filmmakers out there who are going to want this as soon as possible. Where will they be able to get it? When will they be able to get it? How much do you think it's going to cost? Uh, we're not announcing the official MSRP, but uh, we're going to come in at under $5,000. Uh, and uh, it will be released uh, quarter two, which we're in uh, sometime this quarter. Here's the situation. You're an amateur content creator, and you want those buttery, smooth shots that you would get with a rail or some sort of gyro-stabilized platform, but you don't have the five or $10,000 you would need to buy one. Well, thankfully, we've got Big Balance. Here at Big Balance, they're giving everyone the ability to have those gyro-stabilized shot for a fraction of the cost. Now, the idea is simple. Take a handle and put the electronics into it so I can go 360 degrees around this way, 45 degrees forward and back, and give me the little switches so that I can tilt the camera exactly where I need. Now, the cool thing about this is they design products for every type of camera, every type of shooter. Everything from the Gazelle, which will give you your, your camera phone shots, all the way up to the Mustang, which will give you sort of the action camera shots, to the Husky, which will give you these larger single shot cameras, and then ultimately to the Gorilla and the Brown Bear, which will give you your DSLR support. Now, here's the thing you're going to love, pricing. You may say, oh, it's going to start at $800, it's going to start at $1,000. No, it starts at $220 for the Gazelle, going all the way up to $2,800 for the Brown Bear. So you choose the level of support you need and the amount of cap capabilities you want built into your unit. Now, if you are looking at a steady shot, if you are looking for a way to have your camera phone, your action camera, or your DSLR on that nice, buttery, smooth track, go ahead and check out Big Balance. I, I'm telling you, those big balance ones, I really, really like those. That's the one I want, because yeah. immediately I thought, GoPro. I'll, put, I'll use it for my GoPro. Well, <laughs> that's the thing. I mean, the DJI one is nice, but it's designed for, like, red cameras. I mean, Right. I, that's I, a little beyond you're what not I would be able to spend on something. Exactly. <laughs> but, you know, starting down at 200 yeah. absolutely. Why not get one of those? Uh, what, what, what I did, I did a practice shot. I put one of the GoPro cameras, and I hung it upside down, mm -hmm. and I, like, ran it along the floor. Oh, that's cool. The, and it's so smooth. Ooh, it looks like a rail shot. Yeah, I mean, you could see in the video when you were moving around stuff. Like, for that yeah. size of camera, that would be awesome. Very cool. And as a bonus, nothing caught on fire when I was using those. Which is unusual. For me. Actually, yeah. So that was a plus. <laughs> wow. I'm surprised you get to go to NAB at all. I do. <laughs> Don't tell Lisa. But yeah, oh man, those... Uh, I just, the, the bigger one, it's like, I need the camera equipment before I could even buy that. Right. And well, yeah, like... if, if I had a $40,000 RED camera, yeah. then a $5,000 for a mount, that sounds totally normal. Oh, yeah. But if I'm filming with my camera phone or a GoPro or even like a small camcorder, I, that's going to be out of my price range. Majority of the stuff I do is what I can carry with me. I, like, yeah. you know, can carry a GoPro in my pocket and have that or something. Oh, so I, I want it so, now. So, uh, Big Balance, we've reached out to you. Yeah, can and we if you're get watching that? this video, could we get, like... Are those available two, now? Three, can you get oh, those? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, the other one was, like, a prototype. Yeah, can we get so cool? All right, let's move on. We've got uh, actually a bit of feedback. Remember how we told you we were going to break the feedback out of those big feedback episodes? That's right. We've got one uh, that was a holdover from Dan Simon. 
Uh, he wanted our help in building his PC. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, his, his build, he actually gave us a link that showed us the, the store that he was gonna buy it from. It included an Intel i5, it was a 3.4 gigahertz CPU, a Not Corsair bad. liquid CPU cooler, so it was one of those little heat pumps, uh, an Asus motherboard, a Corsair a 16 gigabyte, eight by two module of memory, Kingston SSD, KC, uh, KC300 SSD, uh, a Western Digital Black hard drive, and an EVGA GTX 7800, or 780. That's a pretty good uh, yeah. setup. About That's 1500 bucks. It's yeah. a solid setup. There are a few things I, you I want to change around. Change. Let's, let's, let's talk about this. All okay. right. So, he went with an Intel i5 3.4 gigahertz, I'm assuming so that he could free up some of the money to get that EV, EVGA GTX 780 Ti. That is a fantastic card. It is a wonderful card. The problem is it's a $700 <sighs> card. That's the majority of his budget, right? That's, that's, yeah, 50, that's half like of his budget goes to yeah. that. <laughs> Which is, you know, it's not bad. If you don't know the 7, 780, it's basically two 770s glued together. Well, yeah, no, that nice. thing is... Badass. It's yeah. badass, but again, you're you're paying a lot. And here's the thing, we've been playing with a 770. This this thing right here, this PC has a 770. This is silky smooth. It is silky smooth on anything. The only thing the 780 gives you above the 770 at the moment, I know what eventually there'll be games to tax it, is if you're going to do multi-screen gaming, the 780 is much better at that because again, it's got way more pipelines, it's got way more shaders. Makes sense. It makes sense. If you don't have a multiple monitor setup for gaming, and I'm not saying that you have multiple monitors, because everyone right. has multiple monitors. Because you, you could have two monitors and just use one for gaming. Exactly. But exactly. you're talking about having like an array of monitors that all have the game on it. And even actually, even the 770 could do dual monitor gaming just fine. You, you're going to get maximum resolution on most games. But if you were going to do, say, triple monitor, then you would absolutely need, to, need the 780. If you're not doing that, then what I would suggest is you drop the 780, go with a 770. You're going to save yeah. yourself somewhere between 200 and 250 dollars doing that. Because and then you can drop that towards the CPU because right. he he took an i5. And i5s are good. i5s are good, powerful, right? Yeah. But here's the thing: it, it, I would always take an i7 because an i7 is better at video editing. Now that's a for me. Right. He I might do, not be video editing. He but, may not be video editing. But right? I also imagine it's like if you're doing, if you are doing like a multi-screen thing, you'd probably want to do the i7 with the 780. Right. Right. And, and I mean, look, uh, dropping the the uh, 780 and going with the 770 is going to get you between uh, 200 and 250 dollars back. Right. Mm -hmm. Going from an i5, he had what a four 4670. Uh, to an i7-4790, you're, you're only going to be increasing the price by about $85. Yeah. Okay? So, so not. why not do that? And then the other thing that I would suggest is why not use that saving to bump up your SSD? Either get something from the Samsung 840 Evo line, the, mm -hmm. eight, the 512, actually I think it's 480 gigabyte, which would double the space of the SSD, or get two of the Kingston KC300s so that you could have the operating system drive and then like the gaming drive because you ran into that problem with this, right? I did. Uh, so if you play a game like Titanfall, it's 50 gigs and yeah. you run out of space quick when 50 gigs is taken up. Right. So you really got to decide which games are important to you or, you know, have a backup drive for stuff. Yeah. Now he went ahead and got a Western Digital Black, a rotating drive, so that he could have extra space. Right. But what I would say, and actually this is the way I set up my computers, I do have a rotating drive. It is a Western Digital Black because I like speed. Mm -hmm. But if I'm, say, doing video editing, I have a second SSD, a 256 gigabyte or 240 gigabyte SSD in there, which is my, my video editing drive. All my assets go on there. You could just as easily use that for all your games. Yeah, it wouldn't be too bad. Yeah. Um, but you were saying you recommend maybe a, the Samsung? I thought, was there one that you had an issue with? Yeah, so I'm having problems with the 830s. The 830s. Uh, I bought eight, four 830s, uh, what, 18 months ago? And, and the all... last one is on, it's, it's dying now. It's dying now. Yeah. So, so it's not like it was a fluke. You it's had not a fluke. Four... I, yeah, I think there was, there's something with the 830 line. Because I know people kind of give you a they, bad time about supporting Kingston, but yeah, I, I mean, they was, proved themselves worthy. So. Yeah, so this is the enterprise drive. Right. This, this is the one that I, this is the reason why I started going with Kingston, because I've got all of these and all the servers I've ever installed, and I've never replaced one. They're really, really good. They're very, very long lived. This is the one they sent me to upgrade this machine. <laughs> this is their, their HyperX. It's the 3K version. This thing is crazy fast. It's like 550 read and 5, 
foot was 525, 530 right. It's, it's oh, no, 555 read, 510 right. It's, when, when it was in the, I didn't know I had turned on the PC. Oh, that's right, because I didn't tell you that right. I had upgraded it. So I, you know, push the button, and then I'm used to pulling out my phone, looking something up, checking my watch, and then all of a sudden the screen just, it was Boop. like, oh, Windows 8 is there. Yeah. It's like, was it already on? Maybe I should reboot real quick. Yeah. I rebooted, and it just I like... I love that feeling blinked off real quick, and then it came back on. I was like, oh, okay, yeah, he put the SSD, put SSD in, in there. there. Yeah, okay. Now, now the, uh, again, I have used five different manufacturers' SSDs. I've mm -hmm. used Samsung, I've used Intel, I've used Kingston, I've used Crucial, and I've used OCZ. OCZ was a piece of crap. Okay. I, it was craptacular. I, will, I have no problem saying on the stream. <laughs> that, that was probably in my machine for a total of... 40 minutes before I pulled it out. Okay. Um, something happened to the Crucial. I'm not sure what it was. I think it was, a, it was a product issue. The Intels are actually rock solid, but I wasn't so happy with the price performance. I'm having way a lot of issues with the Samsungs. Kingston's, mm -hmm. I have not replaced the single SSD yet. And as long as you don't buy the value line, because the value line of all the SSD lines, all, all the SSD manufacturers are kind of junk. Yeah. yeah. Uh, buy, buy a decent one of the line, and you'll get great performance. Well, if you save money on your video card, you can keep the SSD and then upgrade your CPU. Because the experience right. I've had is that if I have a good base of a CPU and hard drive, like the, the GPU yeah. um, cycle of like upcoming cards always mm -hmm. seems to go a little bit faster. So I usually, my setup is I buy like a $200 graphics card and then in two years I buy another one. Right. And it's, it blows my old graphics card out of the water. Yeah, yeah. But so but that, That's the thing. I mean, if you wait, if you wait, that 780 is event in two years. It's going to be a three hundred dollar card. Right. And it's the waiting. That's the hard it's part. It's the waiting. But I mean, it's pulling it's, it's the trigger. Not, you're you're not going to notice it. I mean, did you were you longing for the 780 when you were playing on this? No. Exactly. No. Exactly. So, now, the, the one other thing is he's going with 16 gigabytes of memory. This machine we upgraded to 32 gigabytes using, again, Kingston's uh, super crazy fast with heat spreader <laughs> memory. Yeah, you can tell by the heat sinks how cool. Which is nice. And we've actually we've got an upcoming episode of Know How where we're going to show you exactly how much performance you gain from every upgrade. We went, we changed video cards, we changed memory, and we changed the SSD. Incrementally, the, too. Incrementally. So you could see the actual change in, right. in, in upgrade. So you'll be able to decide for yourself what you want to upgrade. Uh, but for me, I'd, I'd say the first thing that always you upgrade, if you upgrade anything... Is memory. It, it, well, no. that's the easiest one to upgrade. Oh, that's the easiest one, right. right. SSD gives you the best price performance. The very last thing would be the video card. Yeah. Because yeah. it's just, that's a big expense. Okay. So, uh... I, I, I realize, Dan, that we have answered absolutely none of your questions, but we <laughs> Sorry, got... Sorry, we get sidetracked when it we comes got to hardware. We like to talk about stuff like that. <sighs> oh, one last thing. He got the liquid cooler, which, again, I love liquid coolers, yeah. but here's the problem. In your setup, your CPU is not going to generate the most heat. It's going to be your graphics card, yes. So if you don't have a heat pump system that has some sort of heat uh, removal device that goes onto your video card, it's kind. It's not really doing a whole lot. It's, you're lowering the, the temperature of the case, but if you really want to get effective, it's got to cover both the CPU and the GPU, yeah. and it's got to pump it out of the case. Those water cooler, the self-contained water coolers are pretty slick. They're but very slick. If you're not planning on doing a lot of overclocking... Yeah, don't do it. Yeah, I go, go air-cooled. The other thing is, if you've got a water-cooled system, you do have to maintain it, because <laughs> it can get nasty really, really fast. I know someone who uh, had an experience with that. Oh. Yeah, Alex, Alex? actually yeah. was an early adopter of water cooling. Alex, how did that go? Uh, it's the Parts were leaking eventually. <laughs> yeah. And I had like crusty uh, blue stuff all over my case. At it looked cool when we first put it together. At first. But oh, the maintenance. So Alex, I hear that uh, water and uh, electrical components, they really like each other. Oh yeah, real good. Yeah. So, so take it over for what it's worth. I would yeah. go with the air cooled system unless you're willing to spend the extra to go ahead and, and air and water cool the GPU as well. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. yep. And then go play games. And then go play games. Now, folks, we're going to be adding a new segment here, something that I want to do every once in a while, along with the feedback called the parting shot. The idea is that Brian and I are going to be going around the internet every once in a while and finding something that's either incredibly cool or incredibly derp. Which there is a lot of on There's the a lot of, a lot. Now, we're going to do a derp next time, but I thought this time we should do a cool. Now, uh, Alex, if you could run this next video, this is, this is one of the best optical illusions that we have seen this year. Uh, this comes to us from, I believe, Slate Magazine. That's it. Now, okay, that, so that take transition? a look at this. 
take a look at this. Now, it should work on, over the stream as well. Pick a spot, pick a single spot on the screen and just watch it. Uh, you, you got your spot right? I got my spot. Okay, so what color is that spot? It looks teal. Okay, now as it flips between horizontal and vertical, continue looking at that spot. Does it look like the color is changing? Yeah, they are changing. It changes, it changes shade, right? Right. No. What? It doesn't. Actually, Wait, uh, what? And I, I didn't believe them, so I took this, this GIF and I put it into Adobe Premiere and I sampled the spots. It's actually the exact, the, 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 the colors aren't changing, the lines are just changing from, from horizontal to vertical. Oh my God. It's persistence of vision that makes your eyes think that you've changed shades. Oh, geez. Yeah, that is messing with me right now. Absolutely. So, <laughs> hey, Stream, if you're watching this, uh, again, pick a spot, <laughs> take a look, and if you don't believe me, go ahead and drop this into your favorite video or photo editor of choice, sample the colors, and yeah, it's the exact same color. Okay, <laughs> stop. My eyes are hurting. Stop. <laughs> oh, wow. We got it. Why do you look blue now? That might actually be kind of derp. <laughs> that might have been a derp for that, us. That might have been derp. Oh. Uh, okay, let's, All uh, right, let's wrap it up. Let's wrap it up. Yeah, we've done a lot of stuff here between your steam machine, between <sighs> this ultimate machine, and between me almost setting fire to our house. Oh, and rocket fuel. Oh, uh, I, I think it's time was to that wrap it this up. episode? That was this. I know, right? Yeah. Uh, split this at eleven o'clock. If we if we didn't have a repository for all that information, how would you ever remember it? But we, we do. do. That's right. We we've do. got our show notes. Go to twittv kh. There you'll see all of our episodes, and more importantly, you'll see the show notes attached to those episodes. If you want to find out about uh, that rocket fuel thing mm -hmm. from the EU, there'll be a link to that. You want to find out about how I looked at those products at NAB, that segment will be there. If you want to find out where I went to, to, to uh, play with Brian's Steam Machine, jump in and you'll see <laughs> that as well. Also, you can email us at knowhow at twit.tv. Brian, you checked that mail, right? Oh, not at all. And no. me neither. So it almost probably, you probably doesn't really no, exist. Don't do that. Yeah. No. But what you can do is you can actually find us on our Google Plus page. There's plenty of other ways to reach out to us. And the Google Plus page is a great place to share any projects that you may have built from watching our episodes. Or if you have a question, there are a ton of other know it alls in there. So you don't have to listen to us the whole time. Please don't, because mm -hmm. I don't. Oh, My eye is twitching from that thing earlier. Actually, I'm looking up at the lights, and now they look different colors. <laughs> <sighs> My brain is weird. OK, also, you can find us on Twitter. If you're not mm -hmm. into the Google Plus groove, you can find me at twitter.com slash PadreSJ. That's at PadreSJ. And I'm at cranky underscore hippo. And also, don't forget about our TD, the, the guy who blew up his computer with liquid cooling. Actually, sp speaking of which, before oh. we go, I have uh -huh. pictures of that night that we did some maintenance oh, okay. on my computer, oh, yeah. Brian, if you want to. Yeah, it was probably longer that. ago than I want to remember. Oh, so, nice machine. So there's there's computer open up upside down because we needed to drain the system before we took <laughs> everything apart to clean everything. Yep. <laughs> so kind of go through here. But and, you uh, see in this, he he had coolers for the CPU and the right? video and, and and the hard drives. And the hard drive. I love definitely. the hair. Yeah, so okay, <laughs> there there we go. We're draining the system. Yeah, okay, yep. whatever. Yeah, okay, yeah, so that's good. Oh, we oh, ever filmed it too. Ooh, look at that camera. Wait, did you did you have neon fluid? No, it, it, was, it was it was the whatever blue stuff blue. that, uh, oh, okay. that Coolant uh, came with. So there's it's okay. Oh, so it's drained wait, now. You can see looking, the crusty oh, blue no. stuff over on the hard drive uh, cooler oh, no. pads. Oh, that's not good. So we're I mean, do people still use that kind of system for yeah, cooling? They do. They do. Okay, it's good. Oh, you're looking at that. Oh, okay. Ugh. That so, can't make so it, it was leaking out of the out of the connections there, and then dripping down to the bottom of the case, and just making a whole mess. Of wait, stuff. was this just liquid cooling, or did you actually refrigerate? Uh, no, this no. is liquid. Oh, look at liquid. Yeah. It was uh, yeah, whatever. It piped like, to glycol. like a, yeah. a fan system on top of the PC. Yeah, it was it was um, it was a, a coolant made it so it was like it was a case that they made that they coolant, modified yeah. the top and put their little yep. cooler thing on. And... So Alex, w with your experience, would you suggest that someone do water cooling? No, it's just a pain. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. I mean, it was fun, but it was yeah. It was just do you think pain. that's what killed one of your video cards? No, no, no they just, they uh, died later. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. Alex's machine was a beast Ooh. when it first came out. It go. had dual seventy eight. Dual, dual G4 7800s. Oh, yeah. yeah, there's, that there's is the, tragic. there's and the this was, after, after we after we took it apart and cleaned it. Yeah, and this was the uh, Pentium D, like right before the, this, they came this out. This was with the, the Pentium D slash fast. Pentium Four, or the Pentium Extreme. So right. it's technically a D, but it was it had hyper threading. Right, and it, uh, sadly, it was like but, right before yeah. they announced the core. Um, Duo yeah, stuff. right, right before that, and that, that was like, like a huge look, step up. Look at all that, uh, all that goo, uh, just crusty stuff. Well, there you have it, folks. That's how you know Know How is a good show. Our yeah. TD could be the host. I, he could. No. could. What are you trying to say, Padre? I'm thinking we should get rid of you or me. 
If I disappear, I need oh, you people we gotta end to the show. Okay. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballas, sir. I'm Brian Burnett. And now that you know, go do it. And then collect. we got that one. Yeah, that's okay. How so I was that's ready. how it should work. <laughs>